in Acts chapter 27, and we're going to deviate from our series for two weeks uh, out of uh, Matthew to, uh, to preach something, basically, to study something that I think God has been laying on my heart for a long time. In Acts chapter 27, Paul is a prisoner, and he's being taken to Rome. And if you remember, he's being taken to Rome by the will of the Father. God had told him through a prophetic vision that he was going to be bound, that he was going to be transported, and that he would eventually go and proclaim the gospel before Caesar himself. And so God is preparing to establish a church in Rome. He's preparing to save people. He's preparing to do something awesome. And so God has a plan for Paul, and he starts to put that into practice. And, and, and unfortunately for Paul, we might say, uh, that included him being arrested, him being bound, and him sailing on a ship uh, on his way to Rome. Now, if you remember, uh, there's a great and a violent storm. And, and as he's on his way, they get uh, to the point where they're starting to lose the ship. And the guards say, oh, we've got a great answer, right? What do we do so that I don't lose all of our prisoners? Oh, you just kill them, right? You just kill everybody. And if we kill everybody, then we can say before Caesar that we didn't lose any prisoners. And so they get ready to execute their plan and execute their prisoners. And Paul speaks up and he says, no, no, the Lord has told me all you have to do is let us live. But everybody has to stay together. And sure enough, just as God had said, just as Paul had foretold, they stay together and they end up shipwrecked on Malta. And as we pick up our story here. Um, and we see the shipwrecked prisoners and the shipwrecked Paul. I wonder as we start this year, how many of you felt a little personally, emotionally, physically, or spiritually shipwrecked in 2019? Did you have those kind of things where, where maybe something happened that you just weren't expecting? Something happened? That, that took you by surprise. Something happened that was so great that maybe you thought you were going to die, but somehow you're still here. Uh, you have made it and God has been glorified in it, I pray. But, but you know what? It is not unusual for us to have trouble. In fact, Jesus told us that we would have trouble. He told us that the world would not hate or the world would not love us, that it would hate us because it hated him. But there is great hope for those who trust in the Lord. And, and literally, I'm going to say this again and again, and I hope I never stop saying it, but the safest place to be is in the center of God's will for your life today. And as we start out our 2019 um, and we read our 2020, I've already messed it up. It was bound to happen. As we start out 2020, I pray that today would be a day of recommitment. A day would be a day of picking up the pieces from the shipwreck. And today is a day to honor God and to start this year uh, with great excitement as we pick up the pieces and we follow Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so today, if you have your Bibles, would you open up to Ma uh, Acts chapter 28, verse 1 through 10. I'm going to change the year. I'm going to change the book. Acts 28. Once safely ashore, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The local people showed us extraordinary kindness. They lit a fire and took us all in since it was raining and cold. As Paul gathered a bundle of brushwood and put it on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened itself on his hand. When the local people saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to one another, This man, no doubt, is a murderer. Even though he has escaped the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. But he shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no harm. They expected that he would begin to swell up or suddenly drop dead after they waited a long time. Notice that. After they waited a long time and saw nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Now in the area around the place was an estate belonging to the leading man of the island named uh, Pubilus, who welcomed us and entertained us hospitably for three days. Publ Publius, his father, was in bed suffering from fever and dys dysentery. Paul went to him and praying and laid his hands on him and he healed him. After this, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. So they heaped many honors on us and when we sailed, they gave us what we needed. 
Well, let's pray. Father, I thank you for the day, and I thank you even for my tied tongue, but I pray, Lord, that you would loose it. And I pray, Lord, that you would just give us your spirit today, that you would challenge our hearts, and that you would let us see you, Father, for you are great and mighty. You are the hero of the Bible and the hero of our lives and definitely the hero of this church. And so may it be so, Father, that we draw close to you, that we get back in step with you if we are not, and that we pick up the pieces in you to follow you this year. May it be so for the glory of your name. Amen. So the first point today is pretty simple. When the storm is over, get back to work. Now, as we look at verses 1 and uh, one through 3, um, we see that they have survived the shipwreck. And that's fair enough, right? Um, many of us have survived. Uh, you know, some of us have gone on to be with the Lord this last year. Um, but, but they made it. They made it. And for us who are still looking and our faith has not been perfected because we're still here, um, they made it. They made it through the year. We're, we're still here. We're still moving forward. Any of you know who Mark Lowry is, the Christian comedian and singer? He's the one that sings um, uh, uh, Mary, Did You Know? Uh, he wrote that song, Beautiful, Beautiful Heart and a Funny Man. He says in his stand-up that his favorite verse is, This too shall pass. And so how many of you had a bad year in 2019? Well, this too shall pass. How many of you had a good year? This too shall pass. Uh, you, know, uh, you know what? Life is always changing, isn't it? Life is always changing. There's always something going on. And so we see, ready or not, that 2020 is here. And with it comes a challenge, and a challenge that I believe that God has been placing on my heart for well over a year. A, a challenge that has a few legs and, and Lord willing, um, should be presented over the next two weeks. And it starts with just a simple message of faithfulness. And it continues next week with an attitude and a value um, that we'll talk about very significantly. But, but here in our passage, we pick up after the storm and praise God. It works out like he said, they are alive. So what's the first thing they do? They sit down and mope, right? What do you do after the shipwreck? You gather up all your friends and you tell them how much worse you had it than they did. Isn't that the truth? Oh, you had it bad? Let me tell you what I had. Oh, you had pneumonia? I had double pneumonia. Right? We are good at one-upping everybody on a bad story, and everybody likes to hear it until they, you know, anyway. It is the way it works. They sit down and they write their memoir so that they can capitalize on this wreck so they can sell a book. Paul asks Luke, the doctor, if he has any lawyer friends so that they can sue the shipping company. It's not what happens, is it? They take care of their practical needs. A fire has been started, so they gather up some firewood. You know, I love this. It's so practical. You know, we still live in a very real world, don't we? And when we get out of the shipwreck, we still have to take care of the basic needs of life. We can't neglect them. We have to keep moving forward. We can't just stop and wallow in our sorrow. We can't just dwell on it. And most of the time, we don't need to write a book about it. We just need to get back to what God has called us to do. And that's exactly what Paul is doing. So often we go through the storm and we want some time off. And I'm not saying that time off in and of itself is evil, especially as I'm coming back from vacation. Jesus went alone to spend time to pray. He spent time away so that he could be ready to minister and stay in touch with the Father. But that... Uh, isn't just taking time off and stopping everything you're doing to hang out. There is a time for rest, but there is not a time to rest from God. There is not a time to put your Christianity on hold. There is not a time to stop praying or to stop reading your Bible or to um, deviate from your Christian life so that you can just take a break from God for a little while. There's no support for that in Scripture. There's no support for that practically. If you haven't noticed, when you're sick and you're tired and you're beat up and you're, you're, you've gone through the storm, you're more susceptible to sin and temptation than, than you were when you were doing well. You're more vulnerable to the attacks of Satan. So when you're coming out of the storm, you might be tired, 
But if you don't take care of yourself spiritually, you're not going to stay healthy spiritually. Paul knew that, and so he helps. So when you finally get out of the valley, don't fall back in because of apathy. Keep climbing up the ladder, so to speak, to be with God. And I understand that this is a very simple point, but I fear that we don't always do it. We start strong and we have a victory. And many of us have had great victories in 2019. How many of you, at least in one area of your life, can say that you saw God do something amazing in 2019? Whether it is somebody saved or, or somebody's taken a commitment or God provided something for you or he did something and let you be a witness of it, God is still the hero of our stories. He is still doing great things and he still has plans of great things in store for us. But how many of you have found yourself right after that victory like Elijah? He calls down the fire from heaven, right? They, they burn up the altar. They kill and slaughter the, the prophets of Baal. And then he finds himself shortly after sitting in a gutter of self-despair saying, God, I might as well be dead. I'm all alone. What tremendous highs and what tremendous lows. And so there are simple things that we need to do just as Paul took care of his physical well-being. He, he took care of just being warm and getting out of the rain and God had provided him for that. We need to do the same thing. We need to take care of ourselves physically, but we also need to take care of ourselves spiritually. We need to do stuff like staying in the word of God through despair and through trials and through temptation and through the high times as well as the low times. We need to pray and we need to actually pray. We need to stop and rest for a moment and listen to God as much as we speak. We need to have words that are meaningful and not just random or plentiful or beautiful, but words that we actually believe. We need to talk to God with sincerity and we need to trust in his grace with faith that he will do what is awesome and what is great. In other words, we need to be in, the, in, in our Christian walk for the long haul. When I was growing up, I played football and, uh, and played baseball and played soccer. And uh, one year in my junior or in my freshman year, I got hurt very badly. I, uh, I hit this guy. He went up in the air. He came back down. I was wearing big mud cleats and my foot stuck and, and he landed on my knee and uh, bit my knee backwards. And it was, it was bad. And uh, there was lots of screaming. I remember that. Um, well, they took me to the doctor and I had such incredible, um, incredible pain that it started muscle spasming and it would lift up in the air um, all on its own. And, and I would cry and, and the people around me would cry. And uh, it, was, it was terrible. And I was on crutches for a long, long time. When it finally came out, um, I wanted to get back into it and build the strength up. And so I decided that I would run track. I had never run track before, but, uh, but I was sure that I could do it. And so I went out there and, uh, and they asked me, well, what do you want to run? Well, what's shortest? That's what I want to run because whatever's easiest, right? That's, that's what I want to do. And little did I know how silly I was. But, but that's what I wanted to do. You know, just give me the sprint. I, I don't want to do anything longer than 100. I have to run the 200. Okay, but that's it. Don't, don't make me run anything further than that. I'll, I'll, I'll participate in those little quick things because I thought it would be easier. I thought it would, would not take as much work. And, and little did I know it, it was a tremendous amount of work. Some of us are very much like that in our Christian lives. Now, I was able to build my strength back up and, and build great leg strength eventually, but, but I fought it kind of all of the way. But how many of us are like that in our Christian walks? We, we've been hurt, and we want the quick fix to our Christianity, but we really don't want to take care of ourselves for the long haul. We're not willing to run the mile or the two miles or the 10K or whatever it takes because we just want the Christian sprint. I want to be faithful real fast and real hard on Sundays, but then take the rest of the days off and just kind of coast. And the truth of the matter is, is um, that Christian faithfulness stops as soon as the football game comes on, right? We've got to be in it for the long haul. 
We've got to take care of ourselves. And I believe that God is challenging us this year to take care of ourselves physically, to take care of ourselves emotionally. There are things that we need to get a hold of mentally and make sure that we are well so that we are not distracted from the work that God has called us to do. And so if you need help with that, the church is willing to help you. If you need somebody to grieve with you, we'll grieve with you. If you need somebody to rejoice with you, we'll rejoice with you. But only you can decide to open up your Bible and to read it. We've got devotions even on our our app. If you want to do that, you don't even have to look it up. You can just click on it. Um, maybe you maybe you need to spend some time in prayer and you need to follow the example of Jesus and just get away for a little while and do some real listening. But just as we uh, follow the example of Paul and take care of the practical needs so that we can do what God has called us to do, we need to do the same thing. Take care of yourself this year. Take care of yourself and be in it for the long haul. Let me say one more thing. There is a time for a spiritual break, or for a physical break, not spiritual. God instituted a day of rest, the Sabbath, right? And the Sabbath was created for us, not the other way around. There is a time for a break, but there is never a time for a break from God. And so while your body may need a time to rest, your spirit needs to be continually fed by the Lord. And so spend your time in prayer this year. Spend your time with him and be about the business of the Lord. In fact, Luke 9, 62, similar concept, but I'm going to go ahead and share it anyway. But Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. There is no turning back. Just as you continue to take your vitamins, or if you get sick, you continue to take your antibiotics. Don't stop before you're done. And we're not done until we make it to heaven. So keep on keeping on in Jesus. Secondly, when the storm is over, new challenges will appear and finger pointers will linger. Now we start in verse 3 here, and I like this. Paul, well I don't like that Paul gets bit by a viper, but I do like the response. Paul gets bit by a viper, and, and, uh, and we see that everybody stands around and waits. Now, there are those that would say, well, wait a minute, Malta is an island in Europe. Um, they don't have venomous snakes. But remember that this was a long time ago. Um, the island was scarcely populated at this time. And even though now it has one of the highest populations per square mile in Europe. Um, let me give you an example. In the U.S., we have about 92 people per square mile. Isn't that amazing? I didn't realize that it was that low. Do you know what it is in Malta? 4,100 people per square mile. There's no room for snakes. (laughs) There's no room for anything. Um, Not much room. And so interestingly, um, they have found carvings in gravestones, epitaphs, of people that were bit by these vipers and died. In fact, in one fairly recent archaeological find, they had dug up and found an area where it told the story of a man who had been shipwrecked on the island and he died by a viper's bite. And so apparently shipwrecks and viper bites were fairly common at Malta. And so this is what they expect to happen to Paul. They figured he must be evil, that the God of justice must be carrying out his sentence. And so let me just say two things here. Notice that he doesn't die, and when they don't, when he doesn't die, they think he's a god. But also notice, unlike in Lystra, uh, that they don't worship him either, do they? And so some people have believed that the, the indication here could be that they didn't actually think he was a god, but a, a favorite of the gods. Eh, maybe. But secondly, detail, uh, the detail is given here, and it's significant because of whom it points to. And just to be clear, the hero of this story is not Paul. The hero of the story is always God. It's always that way in the Bible. But in the meantime, what did the people do? Now I want you to notice that Paul has come out of the shipwreck. Everything seems to be great. Yes, my troubles are over, and what happens? He gets bit. How many of you have felt a little bit like that? I just got out of the shipwreck, and I got bit by a viper. (laughs) 
just got out of this and now this happens. I just paid this bill and now another one. I just had this problem and now this other one. It's always something else. This world is going to have troubles. But this world is not our hope. This world is not our home. Uh, we have one that is yet to come that is perfect and holy and wonderful. And so the people of Malta see him get bit. They try to figure it out. They come to their own conclusions. And then they figure that he is cursed and try to find out why he must be cursed. Why the gods hate him. Now, how many of you, if you were Paul, have felt very much like this? You've got out of one situation, you've got into another, something else happens, and, and you have been helped by the very helpful people around you who have stood by and said, oh, I wonder when you're going to die. Oh, we're just waiting. Uh, would you hurry up about it? Because we're kind of busy. How many of you remember the story of Jonah? Good intentions, maybe. Bad heart. He's, he goes, he preaches. If Nineveh repents, he finally goes up on the hill and he sits and he waits there for the destruction of Nineveh. He waits for the wrath of God to be poured out on them. May it never be so. How could it be that God's people would ever delight in the destruction of anyone? It should never be. We should never be these people. But you know what? That doesn't mean that it doesn't ever happen. Because the truth of the story is, or the, and, and the reality of the world that we live in, is that how many good stories do you read or see on the news for every bad one? Or maybe I should say it the other way around. How many hundred bad news stories do you get before you get one positive one? The bad news sells. When we're standing around and we're talking to, other, to, other, to one another and we're, we're sympathizing with one another, sometimes we glory in that which is horrible. We should not. And if we don't have anything bad enough, apparently we can talk about somebody else's bad. But it should not be. If God wants only what is our best, then shouldn't we as a church only want the best for those around us? especially those who belong to the family of God? That's part of the challenge this year. There's going to be troubles. And it could be true. There could be things that you have done that, that require a consequence of sin. And it could be that God is disciplining you. And it could be that God is trying to get your attention. But it could be that somebody else has sinned. It could just be that that's the way it is. In fact, Jesus was faced with this in his ministry. In John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, as he was passing by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked, asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Is not exactly what it is. We see something, we try to come to our own conclusion, and we blame the person going through the trouble. And Jesus says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus answered. This came about so that, the, so that God's works might be displayed in him. Do you think that maybe God still wants to display his works in you? That God is still trying to get a hold of our community and our nation and our world so that he may be uh, declared and his glory shown so that people might be saved? This happened so that the work of God might be displayed. You know what? People don't change much. But when we are faithful, God is glorified. And so Paul responds by ignoring it. We don't actually see a response of Paul, do we? We don't see him stand up and stomp his feet and demand uh, respect or demand what he got. Instead, he gives no ear to those who have something negative to say. And I'm going to say, what a great example for us to follow as a church as we enter this new year. As we come out of the storm and we get ready for this year, as we move forward to serve the Lord, there are inevitably going to be troubles. There's going to be a viper. There's going to be a snake. There's going to be a problem. There's going to be a shipwreck. There's going to be something. May it never have an ear with us. May we be the people that would never want to hear the gossip, the bad news, the dirt on someone else. Or we could do what Jesus did when Peter is standing there and Jesus tells of his, his crucifixion. Do you remember the response of Peter? 
So, oh no, Lord, may it never be. That's never going to happen. And Jesus oh so gently says, get behind me, Satan. Well, I'm guessing that not many of us want to call our neighbor Satan. And so maybe that's not exactly the answer that we need. But, but maybe we ought to just shut it down by not listening to it. And so as we enter 2020, we can't let anyone stop us from doing the work of God. But don't make the mistake, no matter what happens, don't make the mistake of pointing fingers ignorantly. And don't make the mistake of making people the enemy. We may live in a community where negative sells. And we may even have some of that in our church at time to time. I don't know that we have a lot of it, but it's easy to get discouraged. But people are never the enemy of God. Satan is the enemy. And so let's keep our battle where it belongs in prayer. Let's keep the battle where it belongs in the spiritual realm. And so after the shipwreck, they had issues. But for the one who walks with Jesus, God will still be glorified. And that is the challenge for today. The third point is when the storm is over, God's faithfulness is unmistakable. And so we look at verses 7 through 10. And if you notice there, um, <clears throat> there was an area. There's a man who was leading. Um, <clears throat> his father was in bed with a fever and dysentery. Um, Paul went to him. He prays. He lays his hands and he heals him. And then in verse 9, notice that. After this, the rest of those on the island who had diseases came and were healed also. Everybody on the island was healed. Amen. Boy, we need Paul to come back. Uh, what a mighty movement of God. God absolutely is going to accomplish what he desires to do to bring salvation to the people and to bring the gospel to Caesar. And so God makes it happen. So who's the hero? God is the hero. Think about it all the way through the Bible. Adam and Eve, God provides a sacrifice and a savior. The world is totally evil, but God gives Noah the opportunity to bring a fresh start. Abram and Sarah are barren, but God provides the promise of a son and a savior. Abraham is asked to sacrifice his son, and God provides the sacrifice. The Israelites in slavery, God delivers them. Three Jewish boys thrown in a fiery furnace, and God shows up and saves them. David faces Goliath. Daniel in the lion's den. Gideon faces a multitude. Esther needs to face the king, and so on and so forth. In each of those stories, they faced a storm, a viper, so to speak, and they were faithful, and God showed up and did something awesome. God showed up and was glorified because he is the king of kings. When you do what God wants you to do, he will finish the work that he has, stopped, he has started because nothing can stop the Lord. And so, as I said, God is a hero of every Bible story. And so Paul doesn't die in the storm. He doesn't die by the bite. Uh, God is going to fulfill his plan to take the gospel to Caesar. And sure, there's difficulties, but again, the safest place in the world for Paul is right in the center of God's will for his life. And isn't that absolutely still true for us today? We may face difficulties and we may face trials, but we will never be alone if we're with Jesus. And that is a great challenge for us today. When the storm is over, God will still be there. When the storm is over, God's faithfulness can be seen. And when the storm is over, we will see his faithfulness and declare it from the mountaintops. 1 John 1, 3. I, I love what John has to say. He says, what we have seen and heard, we also declare to you. Notice that? What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you. And so he takes and he sees and he hears and he, and he goes and he proclaims it to those that are around. Notice the purpose, so that you may also have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship was with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. God wanted Caesar to be saved and God wants our neighbors to be saved too. And so indeed, we can declare what we have seen and what we have heard as we have weathered the storm and God will still be glorified. And so if God is the hero of the Bible stories, 
Let me just ask you, is he the hero of your story? Now, before you answer that real quick, think about it for just a minute. Because so often we talk about the great work that we did, right? We got that job, oh, you wouldn't believe how awesome I did on that resume. Oh, how I nailed that interview. We, we made it through something. We worked some financial miracle, whatever it is. So often we are willing to take credit. But, but isn't God the hero of your story? When you got the job, who was a hero? When your relationship was restored, when your body was mended, when your heart was comforted, when you dealt with the pain of loss, the death of a friend or family member, when you looked back and said, how in the world did we make it through all of that? God is the hero of those stories. And if God is the hero of the biblical accounts, then perhaps he should still be the hero of our story going forward today. He should be the hero of 2020. And if he is that hero then how can we do anything but praise and worship him? And so let me just ask you as we just kind of close up today, are you in the storm? Are you just out of the storm? Or are you stepping into a new storm? No matter where you're at today, God still has a plan for your life. God still wants to see you, your very best, come to reality. He still wants to see you perfected into his image. He still wants to see others see his glory through whatever it is you're going through. He loves you, he is faithful, and he is willing to be the hero of your story this year. And so will you let him? And as we enter 2020, let's not just let him be the hero of our life, but the hero of our family and the hero of our church and the hero of our nation. It is his anyway. And so let's pray that we will remain faithful to him, that we'll be about his business. Let's honor Jesus, for he is the head of the church. And when we look back over this year, as we enter 2021 in a year, he will be the hero. He will be the provider. He will be the sustainer. He will be the one that did all good things for the glory of the name. And so may it be so that this is the year of the Lord. This is the year that we give everything to Jesus. Let us pray. Father, as we come here today, there are storms all over. Our brothers and sisters in Puerto Rico, those in the persecuted church around the world, <clears throat> like in China right now, having their churches, buildings torn to the ground and blown up. Those in Iran that, that are struggling, and those right here in our own community, Father, that are facing persecution for being yours, for your name, and those that are just dealing with the regular struggles and trials of life, the mental, emotional, and physical strains of, of being in a fallen world. But today, Father, we put all of that beside, uh, uh, to the side just a little bit because we know that as we trust in you, as we rely on you, as we seek you and your best for all of those people affected, including those in this church, that your best can be accomplished, that you can be glorified, and that you can do the amazing. And so, Father, would you be the hero of Iran and the hero of China and the hero of Nigeria and the hero of the world and the hero of this nation and this church and these families and these individuals? Father, please be our hero. Help us to seek you with all of our heart this year. Help us to get back to the center of your will if we have lost track and to get back to, to taking care of ourselves spiritually and then all the other ways will fall in as well. May it be for your glory and for the sake of your name and your kingdom. Amen.